for our inaugural Mowgli talk, we're blessed with a truly special guest. Dr. Lily Wheeler is that rare person who can move effortlessly between the worlds of science and the humanities with equal grace and ease. She's won awards for her groundbreaking research in artificial intelligence, and her visual designs are sought after by galleries and private collections all over the world. Recently, Lily announced that she was taking a sabbatical from her academic appointments. What she couldn't say then, but what we can now reveal, is that Lily has agreed to become the first designer in residence for the Mowgli Foundation. Lily is truly one of a kind. You might even say she's a singularity, which makes her perfectly suited to give tonight's talk. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Lily Wheeler. Thank you, Betty. And greetings to you all. I have to confess up front that what I'm going to share with you is more about a nagging question and less about any answers that I may have. So my hope is that we might use this as a launch pad to engage in conversation and move forward on this topic together. I want to describe a landscape, a landscape I've begun to explore, and this exploration keeps me up at night. The best metaphor I have to describe this landscape is a tidal wave of change rapidly approaching today's Navy. And we face a binary choice leading to two starkly different futures. A choice to ride this wave and harness its energy leads to a Navy robust in any environment, delivering effects to match the scale and complexity of the situation at hand while maintaining the integrity of the global commons. However, a choice to resist this wave, ignore its presence or somehow try to shelter in place, and the wave will wash over us, grounding today's Navy on the shoals of history. Make no mistake, there is no middle ground. We either ride this wave or we get crushed by the weight of change. What is the nature of this change? In a word, the singularity. We've all heard of the singularity. In Ray Kurzweil's 2006 book, The Singularity is Near, he used the metaphor of a black hole to make the point that the singularity represents a convergence of forces so profound and transformational that it creates an event horizon beyond which nothing can escape, not light, not even information. Our understanding of what lies beyond the event horizon is fundamentally unimaginable. Extending this metaphor to life here on Earth, the singularity represents the emergence of greater than human intelligence from technological means. The emergence of intelligent machines, capable of designing even starter machines, would create its own kind of event horizon, a world in which the unaided human is no longer sufficient and may not even be relevant, leading to a world of accelerating change, a point beyond which the future is fundamentally opaque. Trying to imagine this world by linear extrapolation doesn't cut it. Our ability to think meaningfully about the future just breaks down. So when does the singularity arrive? Well, it's closer than you might think. While exact predictions are tricky, most experts place the year of the singularity at somewhere around 2035. So what do we do then? Well, it's tempting to think that humans should just pack it in and admit that we will be hopelessly left behind. But as it turns out, we've been here before, and history provides us with a clue. When chess champion Garry Kasparov was finally beaten by IBM's Deep Blue, he actually wasn't that surprised. After all, Kasparov knew that automated chess machines had been progressively improving. Conventional wisdom predicted the end of chess and the desertion of the game by the masters. But Kasparov didn't just tuck his tail and pack it in. Instead, he invented a new kind of chess called freestyle chess, in which small teams of human players armed with a laptop played against each other and against machines. Now here's where it gets interesting. In a recent tournament, several groups of grandmasters working side by side with multiple computers entered the competition. The surprise came when the winner turned out to be not a grandmaster with a state-of-the-art computer, but a pair of amateurs using three modest computers at the same time. 
By artfully teeming with their machines, they were able to achieve a collective intelligence smarter than the smartest human and better than the most advanced algorithm. So what does this mean for us? As we've progressed from the age of sail to the age of battleships and on to the unmanned vehicles of today, we've adapted in each age, continuously evolving what it means to team with our machines. But the singularity represents something different. A discontinuity, a true event horizon beyond which I have a hard time seeing clearly. But one thing I can see clearly is that if we're going to be relevant in this post-singularity world, we need to be more like those amateur chess players and craft ways to team with our machines in ways that blur the line between where humans end and where machines begin, and in ways that make us better together than either of us alone, collectively lifting us up to new heights. So now I want to take you back to where we started, back to this tidal wave of change that keeps me up at night. The implication when I began was that this was all about technology, but what if it's not just technology? There's another singularity out there, but this one's almost invisible. We struggle to recognize it, so let me try to make it visible. During my research for this talk, I wandered into the field of complexity theory and the work of Dr. Yarnir Baryam from the New England Complexity Systems Institute in Cambridge. Dr. Baryam illustrates human history as a progressive increase in our ability to achieve ever more complex behavior at ever larger scales. From his work, you can see that each stepwise leap in our ability to exhibit complexity at scale is accompanied by a corresponding paradigm shift in how we organized ourselves, going from hunter-gatherer through early civilization and on to today's modern corporations and bureaucracies. So why is this important? Well, here's another way Dr. Baryam illustrates the point. This time with our organizational control structures plotted along the horizontal axis and the degree of complexity at scale on the vertical axis. And you can see that something really interesting happens at the intersection along the top of the screen. With traditional control structures, our ability to exhibit Complex behavior at scale is limited by the carrying capacity of the one or few individuals at the top. When I first saw that horizontal line running across the graph intersecting at the line of maximum individual complexity, I got an eerie sense of deja vu because it reminded me a lot of the singularity curve we just discussed. And when I placed these two curves side by side, it dawned on me that we're really dealing with two singularities, not just one. In the same way that machine intelligence is overtaking human intelligence, the complexity of our environment is overwhelming our ability to process it with our current organizational control structures. With technology, the trends are easy to see, but complexity is a lot harder to see. And my fear, what keeps me awake at night, is that as long as complexity remains hidden from view, we won't see the singularity until it's too late. To illustrate that point, it's helpful to turn to Thomas Kuhn. In his foundational work, Kuhn talked about how data that doesn't conform to the dominant paradigm gets discarded or ignored as an anomaly. Eventually, the anomalies pile up until they can't be ignored anymore. And finally, the paradigm has to shift. So I'm going to walk you through some scenes from everyday work life. See if you recognize yourself in any of these. And for each scene, Ask yourself, relative to the singularity two, is this an anomaly? Or is this a data point I need to pay attention to? How many of you spend your work days like this? In an organization structured like this? In a work environment like this? Following a process that looks a lot like this? Only to produce an outcome like this. So I ask you, how many anomalies have to pile up before we recognize they're not anomalies at all, but actual data points telling us the industrial age paradigm we're stuck in is a poor match for the complexity rising all around us? Just like with Singularity 1, we are approaching an event horizon beyond which the future is unclear. But I think Dr. Baryam has pointed us in the direction we need to go. Extending his thinking, 
I believe our next evolutionary leap goes beyond the networked organization and approaches a hive mind where our collective complexity is exponentially greater than the sum of its parts and is a better fit for the age of singularity. So what does this all mean and what do we do next? My vision is limited by my own individual carrying capacity. I can only sketch out the broad design parameters for the Navy in the age of singularity. For singularity one, it looks like advanced human machine teaming, modeled after freestyle chess. For singularity two, it looks something like the hive mind and true collective complexity. I can only sketch out the broad parameters. I cannot fill them in. That's where you come in. The Navy needs help from people who are curious about the future and willing to put their imaginations to work. People like you. Are you up for the challenge? If so, then I ask you to work with each other and continue the conversation here. Thank you.